Good evening and welcome. The board concluded our executive session at 6.25 p.m. and we have one action item from the executive session agenda that the board will take action on later in the regular agenda regarding Dr. Furman's contract. I would like to call to order the regular CSD board meeting for February 8th, 2022 at 6.35 p.m. Thank you for joining us this evening. At this time, I'd like to ask everyone to join me in a moment of silent reflection. Thank you. At this time, all that are able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Board members, are there any revisions to the agenda? I'll have one, um, just one ask um, for the board is when we get through uh, Ms. Broon's presentation, um, if we're in agreement, if the board's in agreement on which option to take for the um, adjustment of the FY22 budget, that we do a tentative approval so that we can move forward with planning. Okay. All right, so can I have a motion to approve the agenda for this meeting? Motion to approve for that small change. Thank Second. you. Thank you. All in favor of approving the agenda for this evening, please say aye. 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 Thank you. The agenda for this evening is approved. Our next agenda item is the approval of the minutes from the regular board meeting on January 11th, 2022, and the work session minutes from January 25th, 2022. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes from the previous two board meetings? I move to approve the agenda for the last two board meetings. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor of approving the minutes from the January 11th, 2022 meeting and the January 20, 25th, 2022 <laughs> meeting, please say aye. aye. Thank you. The minutes for the January 11th, 2022 board meeting and the work session on the 20, January 25th, 2022 meeting are approved. At this time, we will move in on our agenda to the spotlight section where we will hear from the staff at Winona Park Elementary, as well as Ms. Gail Rothman from the executive director of the Cater Education Foundation. I will ask Dr. Furman to please present our spotlight presenter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we are gonna start this evening with our spotlight presentation um, from Gail Rothman, Executive Director from the Decatur Education Foundation. She's gonna be sharing the results of a partnership that DEF did with VOX Vox Atlanta to hear from Decatur youth on the topic of mental health over the summer. Um, should they host Vox hosted listening sessions with teens from city schools of Decatur to solicit their input about mental health needs, a current assess and bear, current assesses assets and barriers, and their hopes for the future. Um, Gail, welcome. Thank you. The protocol to leave my mask down while I speak. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Um, thank you and good evening. It's so nice to see all of you in person for a change and get out of my house. <laughs> um, I'm really glad to be here tonight to share um, with our elected school board members, um, our superintendent and staff, and also the public about what we learned from youth um, through our partnership with Fox Atlanta. But I want to start by sharing a part of my job that may not be widely known. It's the hardest part of my work, uh, but also the thing that is most sacred about my work. For over a dozen years, I have sat with grieving families who have lost children and listened to them share about the lives cut short as I work with them to find ways to channel their grief into some kind of legacy or memorial for their child. In too many cases, these stories have a mental health component. This Thursday, two days from now, I will once again sit with a family a little more than a year after the tragic suicide of their daughter. I would like to ask us all to observe a moment of silence in memory of too many students we have lost to what is now a mental health epidemic in our country. In light of the topic of tonight's spotlight, I would also like to ask the board members to allow me more than the usual five to 10 minutes as I know you will be truly interested in what our team has to say about their experiences, and I hope you will be moved by what you hear 
to make even better decisions for our youth in this upcoming budget year. So I want to give a little bit of history and context for um, those of you, um, this may be review for some of you, but um, you may not know how DES got into the business of behavioral health and funding and advocating for our kids' mental health needs. In May 2016, Joe Bodine, who was a resident of Decatur and had graduated from the city schools of Decatur the year before in 2015, lost his battle with addiction. He had um, mental health issues and um, a heroin addiction, and uh, unfortunately, uh, his life was um, ended in 2016 with an overdose. And his mother began, and his family began a fund, the Decatur Education Foundation, Joe's Fund. At that point, Lori Heeman, Joe's mom, um, started on us on a journey that would end um, up with the Decatur Student Center, which I know you have all toured and ribbon cut, and um, what we're, we're all very proud to finally have um, that level of support in our high school. Um, and you can see since then, there was a lot of work that went into getting us to where we are now. The Student Center was created after much input from the community. A position was created in the budget, which is a huge, um, was a huge win. Um, Diane Andre is our um, director of the Student Center. And you can see um, we had a behavioral health committee um, and we made the decision to invest in Renfro Middle School, $100,000 for the expansion of the center to the middle school where we see alarming rates of mental health challenges and substance misuse. Um, we have redesigned and renovated the Tata Student Center um, and, and, and now we are realizing that we need much more input from our youth of where to go next. So Vox Atlanta has been doing, um, and is in the business of youth development and youth voice for a very long time, over 25 years. And um, this is just to give a little bit of context. There was a, there's a 900 person um, study that was done, a survey with youth across Atlanta, included DeKalb County, Fulton County, um, and some other area. And this just gives you a little context beyond the 30 kids that we were able to speak with about what's going on with our students more globally. And as you can see, by far the biggest cause of stress in students' lives, not surprising, is school, um, followed by um, life after high school, which also part of school, body issues, and family challenges. And you can see that there are some good coping um, with stress, some ideas there that we can learn from, creative outlets, sports, exercise, writing, um, things that allow kids to express themselves, obviously, high on the list. Um, very, very disturbing um, trends here on the suicide ideation. We've only seen those numbers go up. Um, you know, we, our community is not the only community, of course, grappling with this, and COVID has made it worse. These numbers have gone up significantly in just one year, um, and that's on suicidal ideation and also knowing someone who um, has had suicidal ideation. A little bit of good news is that on the stigma side of things, this generation coming through now, um, peer to peer, there's a lot more conversations if you're on social media with any kind of youth component. You can see kids are talking about it, they're out there with it, they're sharing it with friends, um, and there's a lot uh, more acceptance in the peer side of things. We need a lot of work on the adult side of things, I would say. So I would encourage everybody to, um, who's listening and also the board, to really look into this survey, voxatlanta.org. You can get all of the information. So what did we do? We wanted to hear from youth. Um, Vox has a really interesting methodology because I think when adults want to hear from youth, we typically do a survey. I know it's easy. We have Google. We Google survey everybody, and then it makes nice little charts and graphs and things, and that's how we get information. But Vox really um, is going to say that's really not the way to get youth to feel valued and, and to have them participate. And so. Um, we contracted with them. It was not cheap. They have years and years of expertise. We were lucky enough that there were two Decatur, City, uh, Decatur High School students who had been working with Vox and were trained leaders and facilitators. Um, Dinah Rogers and Sophie, I don't remember the last name, but it'll come up in the slide. And um, they really spearheaded the project to design and facilitate the sessions for youth. They met with me extensively to find out what does the EF want to learn from this, and then they crafted sessions that um, use trauma-informed, which they told me is now called healing-centered, mm -hmm. saying it in a positive way, but I'm um, using healing-centered practices to make teens feel heard and comfortable and set ground rules, so they put a lot into this. Also, a big difference is we pay 
excuse for their time. This partnership, a lot of the money that DEF spent is we say to kids, kids, we value your input and we're willing to pay for it because, you know, that's, that's, we should value their time. And so this really, it worked. The kids had a lot of good positive things to say. I'm going to email each of you the more in-depth report that has all of the raw data and share with you tonight sort of the higher level themes. So I'm going to play the video. So part of what Vox does is Vox started as a, a um, newspaper. If you've been around Atlanta a long time, you may remember they used to drop off stacks of a youth-driven, youth-written, uh, youth-produced newspaper. Now they've gotten more multimedia and all different. They have blogs and videos. So the, the team at Vox took um, the information that our kids gave during the sessions, which were videotaped. Unfortunately, they were on Zoom because of COVID. And they went through all the data and created this video for us, um, at, which outlines the four. I was young. I know what it's like to be 18. I know what it's like to be 14. We all were there. And the world has changed completely. And we can't know what it's like, nor should we be speaking for other people. And so over the years, we listen to teachers about what do teachers see as needs. Now we ask principals, what do principals see as the needs of our kids? And we ask parents. What do you think are the needs of your kids? And then you think, oh, wait a minute. What about the kids? We partnered with CEM and heard from a study city of the teams throughout a variety of digital tools and for listening sessions to hear what they think would enhance their mental health growing up to care and heard a total of four main themes. The first of those themes would just be the need for more interaction between students and the faculty and counselors in their school. They sent out a survey. If you said you weren't doing well, the only response, it wasn't to me have a time with the counselor for you. It was, I think you should go to this time management seminar. I said big space last year at the Decatur High School Club, and it's basically it all is geared towards peer counseling, and you talk to other Decatur High School students just about stuff that's going on. Local issues, international issues. It's just such a great way to have a way to connect to other people that you would not even have known before, and so that is definitely what helped me this year. Another would be that. They want places, designated places and time to work and to not work. For the stress management, it could look more just like a quick, like, 15 minute clinic, especially on like the weeks, like the last week before break or the last week of every semester. I feel like those are the stressful moments for people. I understand some people may have sports and they have clubs, and sometimes, like, I feel as the rules don't, they see it as, okay, all of this time needs to go to just this and this only. So I think there needs to be a lot less focus on just academics because that's not the only important thing for our mental health. Another theme we heard emerge from these listening sessions is that mental health resources need to be more accessible in Decatur and in our school specifically. There was very little advertising for the student center. No teachers had ever mentioned it to me the first time that I went was for not going to a pep rally, and I really enjoyed it. I think it should be somewhere in one of those areas where everybody knows where everything is, and then if you have the advertisements around that area, you know, people are like, oh, it's right there, and I can just go. There's something really, really valuable about having a physical space, like leave your home and also leave the computer to go talk to someone. And then our last plan team that we heard emerge from these is that mental health education in our school would help to reduce the stigma and fear that's sort of surrounding it now. Reading exercises, talking about not to bully and stay calm and not get overwhelmed, I don't think it's very helpful and it's more of like a chore than a check-in, I feel. It takes too much effort for kids to like try and go find it themselves and they probably don't want to put themselves out there too much. Like that it's really important for people to feel like they are in a space where they're being supported and like people are, are genuinely listening and trying to understand. This requires more systemic change than just like 
isolating out like what they can do for mental health, like labeling it mental health initiatives. And but in reality, like the caters approach to academics and approach to like how we teach and how we integrate mental health education into more general education we need to change maybe like take on a more holistic, fully integrated mindful stance. So I'm just going to touch on the four themes that they outlined. I think they did a good job there. Again, there's a lot of raw data. The way Vox put this together, for it to rise to the level of a theme, it had to come up in all four sessions. And the four sessions had totally different ages and diverse groups of kids in each of the sessions. They were different kids. So if it came up in every session, then it became one of those high-level themes. Um, there's a lot of other things that didn't maybe rise to that level that you can see in the raw data. And some of it is, is painful to read. Um, I think the, some of this are things um, that I'm going to say in a few minutes um, we're already doing, and there's been great progress. Those sessions happened in the summer. The project was supposed to happen in the spring. It got to in June and July. And so the good news is there are there is a lot of things that are already were in the work and are continuing to be in the work. Um, more interaction with the faculties and counselors. A lot of those comments were really about what we know. That Relationships with adults in their lives and in their schools, they do better. They do better on, in all in all ways, and especially on their mental health when they know somebody cares about them. We have countless data. You already know that, and they are not feeling that as much um, currently at the high school. Um, C learning again, they're having some questions about that. Doesn't give us like we're given these activities, but we don't get to connect with the teachers in a way that's sort of authentic and creates those relationships. Um, and they want things that are less transactional and more, again, relational. Um, and having more um, chances, a theme again and again was um, having more regular visits with counsel, school counselors, so that's not just when they're in crisis. And again, they, they have a relationship that they can fall back on. Um, the second theme that was mentioned was designated places and times to work and to not work. I know you know this is an issue that has come up before. Our focus on academics and on being one of the best school systems academically means we have sacrificed in some of the ways to support kids um, in non-academic ways. And sort of their thought about that girl says it really beautifully, like academics aren't the only thing that matter. Um, and we know that as adults, and so we just have to kind of build that in. Small things, one comment was about like normalized taking small breaks, so like I'm not the weird girl touching my toes and stretching in the middle of the class to make that kind of a normal thing. Um, and this last comment, I think, is really telling. They know that they benefit from having extracurricular curriculars, playing sports, but they feel like in order to do that, they have to give up food and sleep. That is disturbing on a lot of levels, right? There's not enough room, and so instead of carving out time from their academics, they're going to do all that and then sacrifice on their health and well-being. Um, this I thought was, you know, this just shows you some of the ways you saw in the video how the youth-led um, sessions use Jamboard and all these different tools to really get kids engaged. You can see a lot of comments about um, study hall, study hall, study hall. The good news is that is being built in now at the high school, but that came up like 14 times in one session. Um, and you can see how they kind of group the things together. Um, more accessible mental health resources. They felt positive about the student center, which was great. A lot has, we've come a long way. This was in June where they, a lot of kids didn't know where it was. Um, as my teacher husband said, if kids don't know where it is now, I don't know what to say because it is, it is publicized. It is everywhere. So I think we've done a better job um, getting the word out and making sure kids know where it is and how to go. Um, but they also feel like there's a lot of top-down resources and they want to see more student-led initiatives. Um, and they want to, again, reduce stigma by having sort of regular check-ins, not only when they're in crisis. Um, this one, I think, for me, um, this one spoke to me a lot in how adults, not school system adults, but adults in, our, adults in general have failed, are failing our kids. And that is sort of not believing them and not really taking them seriously when they talk about their mental health. Um, they had a lot of great ideas for educating younger students so that by the time they needed the help, they would know where to go. There was a lot of confusion about what's a therapist versus a counselor versus an intern and how do I access these different levels of care. Um, and again, a lot of the thought was like, you only care about my mental health 
if it relates to not doing well on a test and you give me a lot of time management, I don't need time management, I need other services. Um, and they have some great ideas like mandatory five minute check-in meetings with counselors over time, again, to build that relationship or have a whole class go to the student center so they really understand it and are educated about what's there. Um, but the last point I think is the point to me that's the really, the part we really need to focus on, which is um, that adults aren't paying attention and don't see us. They don't see our needs. Um, I'm going to actually ask each of the board members, um, there's five, so not many, but everyone else, um, if you would each read one of these out loud. These are words that I think are really powerful um, of the kids, and they really reflect some of what um, those themes we just went over are. So um, you could start, and just each of you, I think hearing them is really powerful. I'd rather cry while taking my math test than miss it and go to the student center. It felt like they cared about mental health only when it got in the way of getting a good grade. We'll take care of your mental health in terms of time management so you will do well on this IV test. There's an idea that mental health is only existent if it is extreme, such as extreme depression or anxiety attacks. In reality, people with no visible symptoms need help too. Cater teachers should work together to give tests on different days to prevent students from being overwhelmed. I wish I could always rest assured that I'm really being listened to. However, it's belittling when adults say things like, are you sure that's necessary? Why can't you just suck it up? And we know what's best for you. Those are some powerful words from our kids right there. Thank you for that. So I want to talk a little bit about the positives. Again, this was several months ago. It's not like our staff at this school isn't working night and day to try to change that culture. So I want to certainly acknowledge that. Some of the things the kids mentioned they just didn't know were already in the work. That's very clear. And some of them we've just made a lot of progress, and that's really great. The wind time in the schedule. Um, the what I need, which is I think twice a week at the high school, and they, the kids can really have a flex time. It's what we used to call study hall, but they can use it for tutoring. They can use it for meeting with other students about projects, about special interests. Um, it's a really flexible time. Diane and Andre also let me know they can use it for individual counseling sessions. They can use it to go to groups. Sometimes there are groups offered during that. So that is a big, that is a great improvement, I think, over, in, over the past schedule. Um, a lot of kids now, most kids know about the student center, and that's great. The high school has a dedicated substance misuse counselor, um, and that's wonderful. No matter how many hours Santa High is there, she is filled up with a waiting list. So, of course, more to be done there. I've heard from Dr. Furman, and I'm thrilled that the current budget draft um, has a goal to get us to the recommended counselor ratio of school counselors 1 to 250 instead of 1 to 500. That is long overdue, and I applaud the efforts to put that um, in this time when we don't have a lot of extra money, and that is really important. Um, and also, um, I've been working and we've been funding the train, uh, the training for assist, which is suicide intervention, and Diane Andre let me know that uh, in, by March, um, 80 adults will have been trained in this very specific, um, it's not prevention, it's suicide intervention, meaning when a student is in suicidal ideation, how adults can move that child to safety from a place of not being safe. Um, and so those are great, great things that are happening. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Well, I'm a fundraiser, of course, I found this interesting, but I think <laughs> as a budget people, you will too. You saw it in the video too, there are a lot of talk from the kids about funding. What is the barrier? They know we're not putting our money where our mouth is. They are not, they are not fooled when we talk both equity and mental health, they are saying, where is the money? Uh, I thought I was surprised, but the sort of they really, really focused a lot of energy on the barrier. Is there not resources being put where they need to be? So that I thought was um, something to note as you're thinking about the budget. So I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Um, I have your attention and I have opinions, and DES has been working um, hard on this issue for a long time. Um, we already know that before the pandemic, we were seeing alarming trends uh, in all things, and we know we're in a worse state now than we were then. Um, we also know, just like food insecurity, kids cannot take advantage of a 
the best school system in the world is not teaching kids who are struggling with mental health. If you are depressed, you are not taking in information. If you are having a panic attack, you are not listening to whatever great lesson is being put before you. And this starts with our youngest kids. So all of this great education is for nothing if we don't get this epidemic under control. Listening to kids takes time and energy and experts and expertise. We are looking at future partnerships with staff. Maybe we can train some CSD staff to be that guide on the side, but give the teens, again, the ability to set the stage for their peers. And we have been talking about this for a long time. I think there's some progress. But CSD needs a comprehensive research-based framework. We're doing a lot of good work. There doesn't seem to be, if there is, it's not being communicated to the community that there is an overall strategy from K-12 that we are being able to assess where we're knocking it out of the park and where we have gaps, like any system, and how do we um, then use resources to, um, to make sure that we're hitting all the things. There's Research has shown there's 10 things that districts who are supporting their kids well have in place. We have a lot of those. There's an S3 collaborative that I know Dr. Huddleston is managing, and hopefully that is a good start. And then um, the funding, I just can't say this part enough. Um, I asked my accountant, because I wasn't sure exactly how much DEF has from Joe's fund, um, and it's about a quarter of a million dollars. Um, and just to put it into a spotlight, the budget for the student center is $13,000 this year. Now, of course, that's not for the therapists and the counselors, but everything that's not personnel is supposed to be funded from a budget of $13,000. The community did the Madison Soapbox Derby and funded the student center at three times the rate that the budget from the school system did. And I just think that's something that has to change. We want the community funding this, but we need you all to put this into the budget. It just has to be a priority. And then we would love you to commit to hearing from youth continually on these topics. So I'll just leave you. People say I'm a big aspirational thinker. So um, this came about from a, a, I'm one of my board members, and I just thought I'd share it. Um, if we turned the tables and started prioritizing mental health over all other things, including academic achievement, I think you'd find that you have great gains in the academic achievement because kids would be supported and would be better able to learn. So I just leave you with that. I know you have a hard job. I know there's not endless money. Um, and we look forward to continuing to partner with you um, because we have to, because this is too important for anything else. So thank you. I will be sending you all the report with the data. And I would absolutely love the opportunity to sit down with you and go deeper into some of these topics. But I really appreciate all the time you've already given me. Um, I look forward to seeing what you'll do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our second spotlight this evening is Winona Park, and Ms. Ruth Scott, and is your counselor Meg going to come up soon? She's support team. Okay. Um, and Ruth is going to share how Winona Park is leveraging their counseling program to support increased social emotional health needs as their students return to face-to-face -face learning this year. Thank you, Ruth. Sometimes the stars just align. <laughs> um, and Gail was here speaking about mental health, and it's also National School Counseling Week. Um, and so I think it's just everything is just aligned perfectly for me to um, talk about our counseling program at Winona Park. So I am Ruth Scott. I'm the principal at Winona Park Elementary, and Dr. Huntington is here with me um, as my school counselor. Um, all right. So last summer, as we began preparing to bring all of our students back to face to face learning, there was a lot of uncertainty and fear about how the students would be returning. Um, we didn't know what their lives had been like for the past one and a half years. Had they been in the school building before? Had they ever sat 20 minutes and listened to a mini lesson before? Um, what kind of trauma had they experienced? Have they been sick? Have their loved ones been sick? Have they lost someone? We didn't know how we would support all these needs and teach them to read, write, add, subtract, and keep a mask on all day. So we started exploring ideas on how to support the social and emotional health of all of our students from day one. We we're very lucky to have a full-time school counselor, Dr. Huntington, who has always supported the students through targeted whole class lessons at least once a month, as well as small groups and individual check-ins. We brainstormed ways we could accelerate her support for all students at Winona Park. 
The Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, or CASEL, states, kindergartners who are strong in social-emotional learning competence are more likely to graduate from high school, complete a college degree, obtain stable employment in young adulthood. CASEL also says that universal SEL interventions enhance young people's social and emotional skills and reduce symptoms of depression and anxiety. So we decided to explore this idea of universal and we created a schedule that included targeted lessons with Dr. Huntington every week for every class and every student. We launched this plan in August, 2021 and Dr. Huntington kindness, respect, following directions, empathy, feelings, conflict resolution, and self-regulation. In September, our behavior referrals were rising and we were feeling very discouraged. After many discussions, analyzing student behavior, and studying tier one or universal interventions, we just doubled down. We were determined to stay the course, seeing that so many of our students still needed consistent social emotional support. We continued weekly lessons for all of our students and added in small groups for those that had more significant social emotional needs. The topics introduced began to deepen, studying individual strengths and goal setting, mindset and empathy, problem solving, and managing emotions. In December, we had decreased our behavior referrals by 80%. Classroom disruptions were minimal and office referrals were rare. Without even noticing, the social emotional climate of the school has stabilized. We are now seeing joy all around us. Joy as they come into the school in the morning, joy in the learning, joy on the playground, and joy during lunch. And our academic gains, which I don't have time to go into, but the academic growth has been substantial as well. At Winona, we value these social emotional skills just as we value academic skills. And we look forward to continuing to support the social emotional health of all of our students. We have a video to share some joy with you. Reading among the Maasai, among the most accomplished and famous <laughs> tribes of Africa, no tribe. Among the most accomplished and famous tribes of Africa, no tribe was considered to have warriors more fearsome or more intelligent than the mighty Maasai. It is perhaps surprising then to learn the traditional greetings that passed between Maasai warriors. And how are the children? It is still the tradition of greeting among the Maasai, acknowledging the high value that the Maasai always place on their children's well-being. Even warriors with no children of their own would always give the traditional answer, all the children are well. Meaning, of course, that peace and safety prevail, that the priorities of protecting the young are in place. That Messiah society has not forgotten its reason for being, its proper function and responsibility. All the children are well means that life is good. It means that the daily struggles for existence do not preclude proper caring for their young. I wonder how it might affect our consciousness of our own 
own children's welfare, if in our culture we took to greeting each other with this daily question, and how are the children? I wonder if we heard that question and passed it along to each other a dozen times a day, if it would begin to make a difference in the reality of how the children are thought of or cared about in our own country. I wonder if every adult among us, parent and non-parent alike, felt an equal way for the daily care and protection of all children in our community, in our towns, in our states, and in our country. And I wonder if we could truly say without hesitation, children are well. Yes, all the children are well. I want to say that since the student center has opened and Diane has been um, on staff that I've been telling her don't forget the little ones don't forget the mm -hmm. little ones because we see these things in the little ones too and they come out in different ways and um, sometimes it comes out with them kicking and screaming and yelling at us um, and sometimes it is just held deep inside them so um, I'm just I'm so grateful for all the great work that we've been able to do um, in CSC for our students and our wonderful counseling program um, do you have any questions Oh, I just um, I want to say thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that and um, thank you for shifting the focus. Um, and, and just like you stated, I mean, very in line with what what Gail was just talking about, you know, we didn't even focus on the academic here, um, although you noted it has improved um, probably because the shift. Um, so I really appreciated seeing um, just a focus on the joy with the kids because I know that's something we were absolutely missing in this last year and a half of being able to even see faces and smiling faces and smiling faces under masks. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for taking the time to put that together. I was going to say thank you for the profound reminder and how are the children. Um, you know, I will be thinking about that for the rest of the, tonight. Um, what would it be like if we had that constant reminder as we greet each other and how are the children, the children are all right. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Scott. At this time, we will move on to public comment. Um, Dr. Furman, do we have any members of the public signed up for um, to share? Three people signed up for public comment this evening. All right. The following information is included in the board policy manual and members of the public are also acknowledged this information when they sign up to speak. This serves as a reminder for all speakers and members of the audience. The opportunity to address the board during public comment is limited to district parents, students, residents, employees, businesses, and organizations. Persons wishing to address the public during public comment must sign in before the public comment period begins and in doing so will be asked to state their connection to CSD and or the city of Decatur. To allow time for the board's other business, public comment will ordinarily be limited to one hour or 20 speakers. At the board's discretion, the comment period may be extended for a specified amount of time 
or a specific number of additional speakers. Comments, I'm sorry, the time limit for all speakers will be three minutes. Persons speaking during public comment will not be permitted to yield the floor or transfer unused time to other speakers. Comments during public comment should be addressed to the board as a body and not to individual members. At the chair's discretion, persons violating this policy may be asked to step down. Speakers should be courteous and professional. Speakers are not to list complaints about specific personnel or individuals connected with the district in a public session. The board will not allow abusive language, threats, comments, jeers, applause, or shouts from the floor. Disruptive persons will be asked to leave the meeting room. The chair may terminate public comments that are profane, vulgar, defamatory, or disruptive. Speakers may not address confidential student or personnel matters, but may submit such concerns to the superintendent in writing. Members of the board will not address persons presenting public comment or speak to the substance of any comments made during public comment. However, a member of the administrative team will follow up with persons speaking at the board meeting. Dr. Furman, will you please call our first speaker? Yes, our first speaker is Patricia Robertson via Zoom, and next up is Quanisha Jackson. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. My name is Patricia Robinson. I am an 11th grader at Decatur High School, and I am mainly speaking on the topic of mental health in the student center at the middle at the middle school. So it's obvious during the pandemic, the issue of mental health has gotten a lot more attention, and this has mainly been because there has been no shield for the overwhelming presence of this issue. And mental health has had a large impact on youth and has sadly been seen, especially through the last couple of years through the passing of community members by way of suicide. And problems like depression and anxiety have become more well known and supported by many schools and organizations in the community. However, these issues are still very prevalent in a lot of minority communities like the black community where health, mental health and trauma continue to be very prevalent issues. You know, in recent times, a lot of prominent black figures have taken their own lives as a result of mental health and trauma. And there are a lot of unresolved issues like that come from racial trauma, economic hardship and stress. All of this really to say that the, the, the Decatur schools have done a great job at supporting the youth in their middle schools and high schools and the student center, where they've done a lot to, to support their students and healthier ways to cope with stress and anxiety. And they've also offered a lot of licensed professionals and therapy sessions as well. And at the high school, especially, the space is very well maintained, efficient, and productive. And there are two main common spaces, office space for people to meet with professionals. However, the main issue I have is at the middle school, there is the space isn't nearly as big or functional. It's a lot harder to cater to the needs of the middle school. And there's not nearly enough privacy for those who are seeking professional help. And this is simply because I don't feel there isn't as much attention being given to the services um, and resources allocated to the center. And I'm simply saying that for the middle school, this issue is just as important, if not to say it's more, but it's very, very, very important. I feel like it's not getting as much attention as what the high school is getting. And this initiative has caused me to frame a whole project over it that I'll be presenting on, on Friday for a separate occasion. But I really do feel like there's more that the board could do to, to allocate more resources to this service. And before I graduate, I would like to see more change towards this and more services that could be allocated to help the middle school students. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is Quanisha Jackson. She, I don't see her in the audience. Um, and after Ms. Jackson, we have Maria Pinkleston. Is Ms. Jackson on Zoom, perhaps? Okay. All right. Well, we will move on to Maria Pinkleston. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Hi. My name is Maria Pinkleton, and I am a City of Decatur resident and parent of a fifth grader at Tally Elementary School. Um, I would just like to thank um, the presenters this evening um, and to applaud the news that extra money is being put towards mental health resources in the system. Um, I think on top of rigorous curriculum, um, the social life of our students, homework, extracurricular activities, there is always such a big weight on their shoulders. 
And when you add the pandemic onto that, it's an even greater weight. Two years has only exacerbated the issues that they are facing every day. Um, I'm concerned though that the recommendation of 250 students to one counselor ratio may not be enough to face the situation we currently face. Um, the American School Counselor Association actually set that ratio in 1965. Um, we didn't have a lot of things in 1965. We didn't have the pressure of students when it comes to body image, social media, um, success, all of the different things that now in 2022, our kids have added onto their backs that I didn't have when I was in high school in the 80s. Um, and so I implore you to look under every sofa cushion you can to find even more money, to move even bolder, if we at all possibly can, beyond the ratio of 250 students for one counselor to 100 students for one counselor. Flood our system with mental health supports around every corner so that children realize that it is natural to reach out to speak to people, that the opportunities for them to reach out to speak are plentiful. Um, and not that this has to be a permanent thing, but I think that pandemic makes things, has made everything bigger, bigger than we've ever seen before. And I think that the number that we should be looking to achieve here should be bigger, um, at least for a couple of years. Um, until we really know that our kids are mentally safe and sound and will be successful as they leave our school system. Thank you. Thank you. Includes public comment. All right, at this time, I'll turn over the agenda to Dr. Furman to share superintendent comments this evening. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, welcome, uh, good evening board members, good evening um, members of the public. Thank you for being here this evening. Uh, just some general updates for this evening. Um, I, uh, Mr. Perez and I have been started our capital outlay and facilities course offered by the Georgia Superintendents Association and have already learned a lot. At least I've learned a lot. I asked Sergio, I said, hey, are you learning anything? And he's like, well, I've met some people. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're not wasting your time. But he's been my translator at those sessions. So thank you, Sergio, for attending those with me. Um, also, our monthly call with Metro Area Superintendents. I had a great opportunity to meet the superintendent from Clayton County, Dr. Beasley. He's just inspirational and uh, just really is all ready to help and offered all kinds of guidance and counsel for me. So that was wonderful meeting there. Um, also attended a GSSA superintendent training um, offered at their annual um, meeting just this a uh, couple weeks ago. Um, also have been continued to meet with stakeholder groups, had our teacher advisory council meeting um, in January, got a lot of great information from our teacher advisory council, as well as our classified staff advisory council. Um, getting input from them on what they are looking forward to in the budget has been helpful as we start moving down the budget planning process. Um, and it was so great to hear um, Ms. Rothman share about what really resonated with me as I've been meeting with the student advisory team at the middle school and the high school, hearing directly from the students on what their needs are, their perceptions of things has just been immensely beneficial to make sure that we're incorporating the student voice as we plan what's best for our students. Um, also have our monthly principal check-in and that was very beneficial as we're moving towards a new staffing plan um, so that they have clear understanding of what that is, have been able to ask questions and gather input as they've moved through their planning um, for their staffing upcoming. Um, this uh, month we've been working with my staff. We had a great um, class three for our leadership academy. Um, Mr. Melton and Mr. Perez presented on operations and information systems. Uh, Ms. Broom and I have been knee deep in, in planning for the budget and, and assessing what our needs are, developing priorities, and then looking at what are the changes coming from the government um, rec recommendations for our budget. Also working on the staffing allotments, which I presented at the work session in January. Um, finishing up our mid-year evaluations has been um, one of our main tasks, as well as reviewing our school's mid-year 
implementation updates and improvement plans. Um, also wanted to share that we have two public sessions coming up for our budget. Um, so the FAVE and the TALI SLT meeting, one is February 9th at FAVE at 445. The TALI SLT is February 24th at 6 p.m. These meetings are open to the public. Um, the link will be uh, posted on our district website. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to get more information about our budget, to share information about, um, we'll have li a link available if they have questions and input that they wanna process. Um, and I will be going over more in-depth information at our SLT meeting about um, the budget, what's in our budget, and kind of some of the critical issues that we're facing as we move forward with budget planning for FY23. Um, I actually did also want to address the Student Center. Um, we do have plans in place to improve the space for the Student Center. Um, we do have some limitations. Of, well, the plans are in place to improve that placement of the Student Center for next school year. There are some limitations this year on moving the Student Center from where it is. Um, we are trying to make some accommodations and put some supports in place to, to help us get through the rest of this school year with the current location of the Student Center but we do have plans in place to move forward with making some improvements for the location of the student center for next year for our middle school students. Um, also wanted to share COVID protocols. Um, we have no changes really to share it this evening, but I did want to share that I will be meeting with our COVID advisory teams over the break, uh, over the, the next break to really discuss what is some criteria that we could put into into place indicator to help decide when it's okay to start peeling back some of our mitigation layers, masking protocols, any of the other uh, mitigation strategies that we have. We know we're hearing a lot more about increased immunity overall um, in our community and nationwide of COVID. What does that look like now um, for us as a community? So I am addressing that and working on how do we create, um, and I think Carmen said an offering <laughs> for some of these mitigation strategies which we definitely want to do as soon as possible, but we also want to keep our staff and students safe. Um, I did want to update the board and the community. Um, the state is continuing with their state accountability measures, which they um, call CCRPI, um, and that is the College and Career Readiness Performance Index, um, and they categorize this through several different, uh, they use several different categories to create a, an index score of 100, um, but they're taking away most of these for the current year, so we will not get a summary rating on that score from 1 to 100 for this current school year. They are going to measure progress or content mastery, so that looks at our students' scores on the milestones assessments um, and other various assessments that we give throughout the school year. That will be reported, uh, but as I said, no summary rating. They are also not doing progress scores because they are creating a new baseline with the scores that we get this current school year. Also, they will not report closing the gap scores again as they are setting a new baseline for this uh, with this data from this school year. And they also, for the readiness indicator, they will not be reporting on attendance. So we'll have some more information to share with our principals and unpack this on how this is going to um, look when the state reports that. But I just wanna update the board that the state is moving forward with some level of accountability measures but much still scaled back from previous years. Wanted to give shout outs. I have lots of shout outs, so sit tight. Uh, first, I wanna give a congratulations to the Renfro and Decatur High School Band. Um, the students were accepted into the Georgia All-State Band. Um, additionally, the, the Decatur Band had the fifth highest representation of any school in the state, and this speaks highly to the dedication and artistry of these young musicians. Congratulations to all. Also, our orchestra students, congratulations um, for those orchestra students on their acceptance to Allstate Orchestra. We are very proud of their hard work. This has been a, a, a new program that we've been getting off the ground, and they've been doing amazing work. I want to give a huge shout out to a student from our high school, Max B. Lindbergh. Um, we are proud of him. He was recognized as a Regeneron Science Talent Search Scholar. Um, this is the oldest and most prestigious science and math competition for high school seniors. Max was a finalist in the competition, and according to records from Regeneron Science Talent Search, Max is both the first semifinalist and the first finalist from Decatur High School in 82 years of this national competition. So wow. huge congratulations to Max. He has won $25,000 in scholarships, and he'll be competing for additional $250,000 um, um, 
Washington, D.C. in March. So way to go, Max. That's huge. Um, also, another celebration for our co very own coach, Mary Souther. She um, and she was selected as the U.S. Track and Field Cross Country Boys Coach of the Year for the state of Georgia. Um, so this is huge. If you know um, Coach Souther, she puts in endless amounts of time and energy very early in the mornings, out in the cold, um, to support our track and field program. So we are honored and want to congratulate Coach Souther. Another um, congratulations for our band. The band was well represented at the GMEA, which is this conference that they do, um, this, and several students participated and won recognitions for their original pieces. Um, we also had students performing um, in a trumpet ensemble. They were accompanied by another middle school, Riverwatch, uh, school symphonic band. Um, we had percussion instructor, Mark, Mark Little. Um, he served on the instructional team as well at Trekka Middle School, um, and he is featured in that ensemble. So just a huge congratulations to um, Tyler Erlich. Er um, he was selected to participate at the GMEA Leadership Symposium for Future Leaders of State Music Educators. Um, so huge congratulations to our band. They're doing amazing work. Uh, we also want to give a shout out to students that were recognized on the College Board National Recognition Awards Program, and we've listed those students here. These out student, outstanding students have received one or more of the following awards, the National African American Recognition Award, the National Hispanic Recognition Award, the National Indigenous Recognition Award, and or the National Rural and Small Town Recognition Award. Our students have earned this recognition because of their academic achievement in school and outstanding performance on the SAT or AP exams. Um, the, and the, they have accomplished these milestones um, at the pinnacle of their career where it's so demanding, but also uh, we know we've been going to school in the midst of a pandemic and has made that even more hard to achieve. So congratulations to these students. Also wanna give a huge congratulations to our um, high school computer science teacher, Deirdre Pierce. Uh, she has accomplished, or she has been accepted into the Amazon Future Engineer Program in partnership with Project STEM. Um, they are giving her a scholarship for that, and we are excited to see how she can use this to expand her computer science program. Also have students that were given the Governor's Honors Semifinalist Award, and these students will compete in a statewide finalist selection process um, this, um, in a few Saturdays at Berry College, and we have them performing in dance, mathematics, and social studies. Also, a big shout out to our high school swim team. We had 14 athletes who competed at the GHSA State Swimming and Dive Meet this past weekend. Overall, our girls team placed 14th and the boys placed 12th. Um, so we had a list here of the 13 um, finishers that were in the top 20. And finally, I wanna give a shout out to our Decatur Debates team. Uh, we had several students um, winning high honors at the most recent debate team, um, and we are proud of their work and their coaches. So, want to support our debate team as well. That concludes my comments for this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to the chair comments. Yesterday, I attended the Georgia Senate Education and Youth Committee meeting with the intent to testify on Senate Bill 377, one of the four anti critical race theory bills in the legislature currently. These bills are troublesome for many reasons. Unfortunately, I was not able to share our board's concerns with the committee because the meeting was limited to allowing the bill's authors to present um, his bill and then to take questions from the other legislatures, legis legislators. Um, the attendees in the meeting were assured that there will be an opportunity for the legislators to hear from the public, and I look forward to sharing the concerns of CSD's board um, relating to that Senate, Senate Bill 377 at that time. It is important for our community to know that these bills not only expand state control as to what is taught and said in Decatur schools and classrooms, but these bills place a tremendous burden on our teachers and school leaders. The board will be sharing a letter with our legislators regarding the harm legislation like this will have on staff and students as well. And actually that letter went out today to our Decatur um, delegation. So I'm gonna read just an excerpt from that letter, um, but that letter um, will be included in the board's um, bulletin that will come out later this week. The um, entire letter will be included. Our letter states, City Schools of Decatur vehemently opposes Senate Bill 375, Senate Bill 377, House Bill 888, and House Bill 1084. 
These bills threaten to harm students, cripple instruction, levy unfunded mandates, impede business, and undermine local control. All of this would be in response to a quote unquote problem that doesn't exist. Supporters might think this legislation would splash cold water on critical race theory, but instead it will drown our ability to do basic schooling. Furthermore, we believe that Georgians deserve legislation that doesn't have its roots in disinformation, and Georgians deserve better than copy and paste legislation handed to them by Washington, D.C. think tanks that don't know Georgians' needs. The bill's chilling effects would extend to addressing Georgia's egregiously disparate, disparate outcomes and manifest on racial lines, that manifest on racial lines. We must talk honestly about race itself to address racial disparities, even when it is uncomfortable. These bills undermine educators' ability to advance educational outcomes for all students. So again, this is just an excerpt from the letter that went out to um, the legislators today. And again, the full um, letter will be included in the board's newsletter later this week. If community members are interested in sharing their opposition to the anti-CRT race theory bills, I would suggest that you email your legislator directly. You can also attend um, and hear one of the hearings or all of the hearings on, on these bills. Um, as soon as we find out when the next hearing is for Senate Bill 377, I will be there and we will post that if community members want to come out um, to support the board statement, or you can also sign up to make your own public comment. This is National School Counselors Week, um, February 7th through the 11th. And the board wishes to express our heartfelt thanks and appreciation for our counselors. These individuals are extremely important as we've been hearing about the work that is happening around mental health here in the district. Um, and so they are extremely important to the student success and overall health and well-being of our schools. Thank you to our counselors for all that you do. Every February, the U.S. honors the contributions and sacrifices of African Americans who helped shape the nation. So we know that February 1st was the start of Black History Month, which celebrates the rich cultural heritage, triumphs, and adversities that are an indelible part of our country's history. Carter G. Woodson, Black History, founded Negro History Week in 1926, and then in 1976, it was lengthened to a month-long celebration. Mr. Woodson wrote, if a race has no history, it has no worthwhile tradition. It becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world, and it stands in danger of being exterminated. This is why I appreciate the efforts of CSC schools not to only teach the history of African Americans, but to also teach the truth about American history. And we will continue to do that um, and do as much as we can as a board to ensure that CSC students are never at risk of their history being exterminated. This concludes my chair's comments. We will now move on to consent agenda items, which include personnel reports, school nutrition, and financial reports. May I have a motion to approve the consent items one through three? Motion to approve consent items one through three. Thank you, may I have a second? Okay. Thank you, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. The consent agenda items one through three are approved. We will now move on to action items for the board this evening. Our first action item is to approve the 2022-2023 board meeting calendar. May I have a motion to approve the 2022-2023 board meeting calendar? Move to approve the 2022-2023 board meeting calendar. May I have a second? second. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. The 2022-2023 board calendar meeting board meeting calendar is approved. <laughs> Our second action item is to approve a one-year extension of Dr. Furman's contract as superintendent of the city schools of Decatur. But before we move forward to that, I'm going to ask, I'm going to invite our attorney, um, Bob Wilson, to come up to make a statement concerning the contract. Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Superintendent. A few weeks ago, the board settled upon 
agreement with Superintendent Furman to extend the contract for a new year starting July the 1st of 2022 and going through June 30th of 2023. That contract was put out through the website of the school system for the public to see. I'm here tonight to let those in attendance, be they here in person or at home, know there have been two slight changes to the contract that was put out. Those changes will be on the website tomorrow. The red line edition will be there. I can't tell you when I'm not a techno guru here, but the system will get it out tomorrow. Section 2.2 and section 4.2 have been slightly changed. There is no true substantive change to the contract. The pay amount, vacation amount, all of those things, sick leave, are exactly the same as they were. Nothing has changed like that. Section 2.2 was changed slightly under the duties of the employment of the superintendent, both for the protection of the superintendent and of the board, and by agreement of both, to make it perfectly clear that this is her full-time position and all of her energies will be focused on the city schools of Decatur and her responsibilities. That is all it does. It simply strengthened that provision so there could be no question about it. Section 4.2 is really a mechanical way of determining a value of days worked uh, in dollars based on the compensation in the event there are any vacation days for which the superintendent might be paid out at the end of the year-long contract. The dollars, the amounts have not changed one bit. It just makes it clear how we calculate that. And that's all that it does. But it was important to this board, to those who are at home and those who are here, that we make it clear to the public that those two slight changes have happened that is the contract you'll be voting on. So it's the slightly different contract you're voting on tonight versus the one that you put out. But those are the only changes. And the red line version will be out tomorrow for anyone that wants to see it. Um, I do have to get that to the system so that they can put that out. But you know what it is. But that is the only difference. No money change at all. No vacation days change. No sick days. Nothing else changed. Those are simply strengthening those two provisions so that mechanics are clear on one end and the responsibilities are clear on the other. Is there any question or anything you think I've left out that we need to make clear to those who are listening? No. Okay. Thank I've you, Tony. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. So may I have a motion to approve a one-year contract extension for Dr. Furman to continue her service as a superintendent? for the City Schools of Decatur. I move to approve a one-year contract extension for Dr. Furman to continue her service as the superintendent for City Schools of Decatur. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. The one-year contract extension for Dr. Furman to continue her service as a superintendent for the City Schools of Decatur is approved. We now move this evening, Dr. Furman will begin this presentation. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to invite our Chief Financial Officer, Ms. Juanita Broom, up to... Oh. We should sign the contract. Yeah. If, um, Dr. Sultan, if you want to start it. the signature and press it down, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Ms. Broom, um, she's going to present an update on the FY22 budget, which will give the board an overview of the proposed changes that came out of the Governor's office as well as an introduction to share some additional information from proposed changes for the FY23 budget. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the board, Dr. Furman, community, and colleagues. Today, I will present an update on the governor's proposed amended fiscal year 22 and fiscal year 23 budget and how it will impact the district's general fund budget. I have included definitions of financial terms for reference as needed. We will look at the budget calendar, projected tax digest updates, and a detailed analysis of the governor's state budget proposal financial impact on the district's fiscal year 22 and 23 budget. 
definitions are listed for common use financial terminology. I have also included in the appendix a budget comparison by function. So I have included definitions of the different function codes. We started budget discussions in November 2021 and have had several discussions on the budget timeline and budget priorities, competitive compensation, historical trends for expenses and revenues, allotment and staffing. At next month's March board meeting, I will present a preliminary budget draft. 2022 projected tax digest update. As you are aware, the Board of Assessors approval of the 2022 personal property digest provides us with the most accurate estimate of property tax revenue, which is the district's largest source of revenue. Prior to receiving the Board of Assessors Personal Property Digest, the district utilizes Georgia State University study to project property tax revenue. The Board of Assessors is scheduled to approve the Personal Property Digest in early June. After the Board of Assessors approve, approval, the Board of Education will approve the millage rate in mid-June. State Budget Proposal Summary. The governor presented the 2022 state of the state address on January 13th. The budget proposal for education included amendments to the current fiscal year 2022 budget and updates for next year's fiscal year 2023 budget. The amended fiscal year 2022 proposed budget is scheduled to be approved by the end of this month or early March. The fiscal year 23 proposed budget is scheduled to be approved by the end of March. Let's start by looking at proposed changes for the current fiscal year 2022 budget. It is important to understand that when the state allocates increases, bonuses, or any additional funds, it is only for those positions earned based on the state QBE formula. Based on this formula, city schools of Decatur earned approximately 445 positions for fiscal year 2022. In addition to the 445 positions that the district has earned, the state has also included approximately 32 school nutrition employees in their proposal, which is why you will see the number 477 as the number of earned positions throughout the presentation. The district has approximately 959 positions, and of those 959 positions, only 445 are earned, and we received a minimum amount of state revenue for those positions. The fiscal year 2022 amended budget proposed for one-time supplement of 1,000 for school nutrition workers. The district does not earn school nutrition workers, so to figure out how many school nutrition employees qualify, I took the district FTE amount for fiscal year 22 and divided it by the state FTE amount for fiscal year 22. I then multiplied by the full state impact of 10.1 million, which gave me 32,000, which will cover 32 employees. The state is proposing to pay the supplement, Medicare, and retirement. The district will be responsible for paying the 6.2% for FICA. To add in retirement and Medicare, the final amount allocated for the 32 school nutrition employees is 38,803. One time supplement of one proposed for earned bus drive. The district earns five bus drivers per the QBE allotment sheet. After adding retirement and Medicare, 6,063 6, we will be allocated to the five bus drivers. One-time supplements of 2,000 are proposed to all full-time employees and 1,000 for part-time employees. We earn approximately 444 time part-time employees. This will equate to a little over 1 million after adding retirement and Medicare. Austerity reduction for fiscal year 22 is proposed to be restored, which will eliminate the 1.3 million reduction in the current budget. Since the austerity reduction is restored, that means more funds from the state, which means the local five mil share will increase. The state uses the most recent equalized adjusted school property tax, tax digest to determine the district's five mil share. An additional 371,867 is projected to increase for the local five-year share. 
is will receive, but the current fiscal year is approximately two million. However, of that two million, a little over one million will be for one-time supplement, which means expenses will increase by that same amount. <clears throat> Dr. Furman and I have developed three options regarding the qualifications for supplemental payments from the state. Option one is to pass on the one-time supplement for state earned positions only. That means that only 32 school nutrition workers will receive the $1,000 bonus. It's the fiscal impact to the district would be 1,984, which is a 6.2% for FICA. Only five bus drivers will receive the 1,000 supplement. The fiscal impact to the district would be 310, which is a 6.2% for FICA. 444 time part time employees will receive the $2,000 supplement. The fiscal impact to the district would be 54,560. Of course, that is for FICA. Additionally, the $1.317 million for our security reduction would be eliminated, and the local five million would increase by 371,867. This slide shows the impact the supplement will have on the fiscal year 22 general fund budget if we serve as a flow through and distribute the supplement only to the number of employees. The fiscal year 22 budget on the left is the budget prior to any state amendment. The state amendment column in the center of the two budgets is the proposed amendment from the state. The amendment budget on the right is the budget after option one amendment. I did not include the revenue or expenses for the one-time supplement since they will basically be a wash and not have an impact on the budget. In revenue, the 371,867 is the increase in local fair share, which brings the local fair share amount to over $9 million, highlighted in yellow. As shown, the $1.3 million austerity reduction has been removed. Expenditures will increase by the total amount of FISA for the supplement, which is the 56854 Highlighted in orange, you see the amount needed from fund balance to balance the budget has decreased in the fiscal year 22 amended budget by approximately $867,000. Highlighted in blue, the projected ending fund balance has increased by the same amount, which increases the fund balance percentage as shown in green from 7.1% to 8.1%. This is one of three options, and it's the option which has the minimum impact on general funds. Option two, is to pass on the supplement to all employees as specified per category. The one-time supplement for school nutrition workers would include the 32 employees that the state will fund and the district would extend the 1,000 supplement to the additional 19 nutrition employees. The district will be responsible for funding 19,000 plus taxes for the 19 employees. For bus drivers, the one-time supplement would be extended to cover all bus drivers. The state will fund the five bus drivers in retirement and Medicare. The district will fund the 1,000 per employee for the, the additional 20 bus drivers in applicable tax. Option two impact on the general fund is as shown. The budget on the left is the current fiscal year 22 budget prior to any state amendment. The amended fiscal year 22 budget is on the right. It's the budget after the amendment, additional supplements and taxes. For revenue, local fair share increases by 371,867, which increased the local fair share to 9 million. Austerity reduction of 1.3 million is eliminated. Total revenue increased by 945,189. Salary and benefits increased by 1.235 million from taxes and supplements outside of those that are earned by the state. The district will fund those additional supplements and taxes. Again, I did not include the state supplements in the budget because it is a wash. The funds we received from the state will increase the revenue amount the same as the expenditures since we will serve as a flow through for the supplement. Highlighted in orange, as shown for the fiscal year 22 amended budget, the amount needed from fund balance to balance the budget has increased by approximately 312000 Highlighted in blue, the projected ending fund balance has decreased by the same amount 
which decreases the fund balance percentage as shown in green from 7.1% to 6.7%. The third and final option is to give all employees the same supplement of 2000 For school nutrition workers, the district would need to fund 1000 for the 32 school nutrition employees that have been allocated 1000 from the state, in addition to 2000 each for the 19 school nutrition employees that were not allocated supplement from the state. The number 51 under the column number of employees represent the number of school nutrition employees that will be impacted by giving 2,000 supplements to all school nutrition employees. The total fiscal impact to the general fund for school nutrition is 91,206. For bus drivers, the district would need to fund 1,000 for the five bus drivers that have been allocated 1,000 from the state in addition to 2,000 for 20 additional bus drivers that were not allocated supplements from the state. The number 25 under the column number of employees represents the number of bus drivers that will be impacted. The total fiscal impact to the general fund for bus drivers is 56,360, which includes supplements in a fiscal tax. 443 represents all other employees that will receive the 2,000 supplements. Employees were allocated 2,000. The employees' fiscal impact for funding 2,000 per employee from general funds is a little under 1.2 million. Again, this amount increases, includes salary and taxes. This is the amended budget after the allocation of 2,000 to every employee. Below, highlighted in orange, is the amount required from fund balance to balance the budget. The amount to meet the amount needed to balance the budget increases from $4.1 million in the fiscal year 22 budget to $4.5 million in the fiscal year 22 amended budget, which is an increase of $407,000. Highlighted in blue, the ending fund balance decreases by the same amount. Fund balance percentage, shown highlighted in green, decreases from 7.1 to 6.5. This slide shows the original budget prior to any state amendment and the three options. I want to reiterate that I did not include the state supplements in the revenue or expenditures since it is a wash. However, the final selected budget will be revised to include all revenues and expenditures. These budgets only show expenses and revenues that will have an impact on the budget. Note the amount highlighted in orange represent the amount that will be required from fund balance. The amounts highlighted in blue represent the projected in the fund balance, and the percentages highlighted in green is the fund balance percentage. Board specifies a minimum fund balance of between 4 and 15 percent. Before I go into fiscal year 23, are there any questions on the fiscal year 22 budget? Yes, please. Um, so just to be clear, we're basically looking at uh, we've already presumed we're going to spend 4.1 million in this year out of our reserves. Mm -hmm. The real question before us is, do we want to put a little bit of money back into that, or do we want to spend even more money than that out of our reserve, based on some of these scenarios? So let me ask, particularly on option number two, uh, I understand that we have to provide the benefit. If we take the money from the state, we have to provide the benefit for the mandated um, uh, individuals, the, whatever the QBD, whatever the term is that we're using, right? Mm -hmm. But for everyone else, I mean, obviously in option one, we're, we could choose not to give them anything. What would be the number that we would provide to the other employees in option number two that would have a zero dollar impact on our presumption of what we would take out of the reserve? It would be very close to a thousand, right? We'd be something like yeah. 989 or something like that. Mm, I have to do the math, but it would be in that ball. So there is a almost equivalent number that we could provide all of the employees that would have a zero impact on the reserve that we have already assumed that we would draw from. No, it's definitely going to have an impact on the reserve. If you give any funds outside of those that are allocated from the state, there's going to be an impact on the And even if you just give what is allocated to the state, there's still that. But the state is giving us the, it's not the 1.3, actually, the state is giving us about 800 some thousand dollars with the removal of the, uh, with the removal of the, uh, 
uh, austerity. So if I if we look at, I want to look at. Uh, I have to pull up this year. Which one we're looking at? I'm correct that you're asking an option one, which is giving only what the state would under QBE given mm -hmm. that returns a whole percent basically to the yeah. fund balance. Correct. Okay. There seems like there would be some gray area between that and option two to maybe give back without actually increasing where we are currently without the budget being fixed by the state. Well, even if we pass on just the bonus to those that earn, there's still a cost to the general fund. I get that there's a cost, mm -hmm. but the cost could be net neutral with what the state is giving yes. us. That is what, with what the state is giving us. Uh, yes. Just depending on how we allocate the so, uh, supplement. So in, in effect, I'm asking what is the amount that we would be able to provide under option two for all of the rest of the employees? that would still leave us with a designated fund from the fund balance of $4.1 million, like we're choosing now. I would definitely have to sit down. And get but it's very high. It's going to be in the $900 plus dollar range, so like not, not over probably $950 range. Yeah, so we'd have a cool. very similar benefit. Yeah. Oh, I'm just, let me ask a clarifying question, Han. So that means those, so of the state allocated people, which is 470 Seven, 477 that we earn through QBE, we would have to select of our 900 and some employees, 959 right. employees, which 445 would get the state allocated bonus versus which would get the 900 some dollars. Yeah. And that would be, how would we determine who would get the, who would get the state allocation versus who would get the... I do, yeah, I recognize the... But it's better than zero if we were to pick option one, right? I mean, so what, it is we're better than option in? one, yeah. <laughs> correct. Right, and, so and they so get that something. Is, correct. Well, they get almost exactly the same thing, a few dollars. Well, more. only bus drivers and school nutrition workers, teachers would be getting $2,000. So you'd have to pick which teachers would get $1,000, like $1,000 versus. A thousand versus the, yeah, okay. And a clarifying point for people listening, that's not, that's a state rule, right? That we can't like put everything in the pot and then divide it in half. Yeah. 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 Correct. Mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely would be challenging to do it that way. I think I'm already out of the shoe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the three options? So you mentioned um, in the agenda change that after discussion you would want to vote tentatively. Um, just on this portion, or we just on this portion? Yeah. yeah. You need to see how it contains. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So Before that she's going to okay. run through okay. option. Yep. The how this would flow through if we look at next year's budget. Okay. Perfect. And so the option that you choose for fiscal year 22 would have a direct impact on next year. This slide has been presented to you before. The first column on the left is the fiscal year 22 budget prior to any amendment. The middle, middle column is changes from the addition of the CARES fund. Column on the right title fiscal year 23 basic budget is your fiscal year 23 starting budget. For fiscal year 23, the governor is proposing a state adjustment of $142 million to the local fair share. Fiscal year 22, we discussed increasing the local fair share due to austerity being restored. For fiscal year 23, increasing local fair share are due to projected tax growth. The 608 austerity being restored and growth from the current digest to next year's digest. In fiscal year 22, we accounted for 371.867 of the 608 listed here. The increase in TRS is included in the district's benefit cost. We anticipate a decrease in enrollment, which will be approximately 777,548 decrease in QBE revenue. The state is increasing revenue for training and experience of current positions, and the district increase is 888,607. For fiscal year 23, full austerity of 1.3 million will be restored. The state is also increasing the state-based salary by 2,000 for earned teachers and certified employees, which for the district would be 933702. 
the total fiscal impact from the governor for fiscal year 23 for city schools of Decatur is approximately 1.7. Next, I took each of the three options and listed the fiscal impact each option would have on the fiscal year 23 budget. Since the year 22, option one budget, which is for the one-time supplement for state-earned positions only, is the first column. The fiscal year 23 state amended budget, state amendment, state amendments are listed in the center column. The revenue revisions consist of the 18 million, the 1.8 million increase in revenue which is the total of the governor's fiscal year 23, 888-607 increase for training and experience, and the 933-702 total increase for the 2000 increase in the state-based salary scale for teachers and certified employees. The 237042 is fiscal year 23 increase in local fair share, and the 1.3 million in austerity has been restored for both fiscal year 22 and 23. Expenditure revisions consist of the 1.258 million in salaries and 649,000 in benefits, which is the district cost for the 2,000 teacher step increase and one step increase for all employees. Fiscal year 23 budget includes a step increase for all employees in addition to the 2,000 step increase for certified employees. Looking at the bottom of the sheet, highlighted in gray is your beginning fund balance. For the fiscal year 22 column, the 6.8 million highlighted in orange is fiscal year 22 projected ending fund balance, which is fiscal year 23 projected beginning fund balance. For fiscal year 23, approximately 3.392 million highlighted in blue is needed from fund balance to balance the budget. This leaves fiscal year 23 ending fund balance at approximately 3.447 million or 3.88 percent of fund balance. Again, the fund balance percentage should be between 4 and 15 percent. This fund balance is below 4 percent. This is fiscal year 22, option 2, which is to extend the state supplement to all positions as specified per category. The state amendments are the same for all three options with the 1.585 increase in revenue, which consists of the increase in training and experience, 2000 increase the salary scale and 237.042 increase in local fair share. The 1.9 increase in salary and benefits are for the $2,000 increase to all certified employees and one step increase, one step increase to all other employees. The beginning fund balance for fiscal year 23 for option 661 million, which is highlighted in gray. 3.392 million highlighted in blue is needed to balance the budget, which leaves an ending fund balance of 2.268 million, which is equivalent to 2.55%. Again, this is below the 4% minimum fund balance per board policy. This is fiscal year 22, option three, which is to give all employees the one time $2,000 supplement. Again, the state amendments are the same for all fiscal year 23 budgets. The difference is the beginning fund balance. For option three, the beginning fund balance, as highlighted in gray, is 5.566 million, and 3.392 million will be required from fund balance to balance the budget, which leaves a projected end of fund balance of 2.173 million, or 2.45%. This slide is a snapshot of all three options on the fiscal year 23 budget. The expenses are the same because I have removed the fiscal year 22 one-time supplement from the fiscal year 23 budget. The only difference in these three budgets is the beginning fund balance highlighted in gray, which impacts the projected ending fund balance. If the board three budgets with the understanding that revisions will be required if there are any revisions to the governor's budget, that budget will be the base budget for fiscal year 23 and will allow Dr. Furman and I to explore different options and build on this budget to present to the board recommendations to maintain a minimum fund balance of 4% for fiscal year 23 and month by year for forecasting. Any questions? I mean, option one is not actually a real option. Agreed. Yeah. Option one is the state telling us 
that you give raises to half of your faculty and staff because this is the formula we have come up with for the way you should run your school systems in the state, or you pay the rent. It also looks like the impact of it in fund balance is pretty similar between the two and three. Can you walk through that? Because it doesn't seem like it should be. Mm -hmm. Like it's like two thousand for everybody or this. What's the difference between option two and three? Yeah. Well, really, the only difference is the true nutrition versus in the. So that's a small amount. Because what it says, what is it? the big difference between the FY22 budget, option two and three, is an additional $1,000 for our school nutrition and bus drivers. So, so it, it made it 20 plus another 19. Right. So it is a minimal impact to go ahead and give everyone that, okay. uh, that $2,000 bonus across the board this year. A huge impact on them for them. This is just things down. Just, so then what happens? What do we do if if we selected to um option three and we're so it seems like we're so far below the minimum of what we should have? Yeah. How do we make up for that? And that's where um once the decision's made, uh Lanita and I can start looking at options for what we need to make adjustments on for the two thousand twenty three uh, the 23 FY23 budget. Um, part of that is already in the works as we are looking at um, adjusting our allocations um, mm -hmm. for staffing. Okay. Um, so the current staffing allotment formula that we're using already does take into consideration that some unfilled positions um, will not be refilled. So that'll increase, decrease our expenditures, okay. um, which will help this process. So um, okay. my, rec my personal recommendation for the board is that we go ahead with option three for FY22 because the impact is not as not to me overly significant. And I think it's something that we can create some additional sacrifices upcoming year to give our, all of our employees that $2,000 bonus. You, option three means that we end the year at 6.5%. Correct. And then what do we need to cut out of the 23 budget to be at 4% in terms of just like final dollar amount? Like that's the oh dollar dollar amount it'll be about like if you look at option one you're at eight eight and if you look on that so I guess about four million so, potentially to find two million for but, I mean I, I just want to speak here really quickly four percent is the absolute minimum minimum right right yep. And that should be aware of it. That is in historic high millage rates for all of the citizens that are in the city. Uh, and that is also before we've actually seen any proposal or presentation on what cuts are going to happen in central office and operations. I'm uncomfortable that we're already talking about cuts on uh, instructional staffing, and we haven't had a conversation yet about cuts on central office. And so I get very nervous talking about pushing this out to the max when I haven't actually seen what we're talking about pulling out of the, the budget at the same time. I know that in 2020, if you, you have in your appendix one of the slides, you could probably toss it up there. Our budget in 2020 was $76 million as a system. That was after tally opened, pre-pandemic. So that should have been, and that is our peak enrollment. 2020 was the year we had the maximum number of students that we had in the system. And so now we have fewer students in the system and we are, what, what's the math, seven million, over seven million dollars more expensive as a system from our peak enrollment. With I'm struggling with having conversations about increasing expenses here when I haven't seen rock solid proposals on on cutting yet. So you have to start with a base. So you mm -hmm. have to know how much you need to mm -hmm. you know, you have this base. You know. mm -hmm. This is actually the first thing. Well, but I mean this is we're talking about setting a baseline of increased expense. We could be talking about setting a baseline of reduced expense as well. There's we're just happening to choose an increased expense baseline. But do we 
we have to make a decision about how we want to handle th this money from the governor in terms mm -hmm. of these employees. Okay. Yeah. I do recognize the time pressure on that. Right. So, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that we not make a decision on that. I'm expressing frustration that we're making a decision on an increase of an expense when we haven't already started talking about a reduction of expense. And, and my question was exactly what you just asked, right? It was like, what is the minimum floor? Which is honestly probably an unacceptable minimal floor to even be mm -hmm. talking about of getting up to 4% here. Um, and you are absolutely correct. And one of the things that shocked me that you have, to, not shocked me, that is appropriate is that instruction has remained between 65 and 68% all the way back to 2018, um, which means that we do need a wholesale look all of the places we can make mm -hmm. cuts. Yep. And this goes back to something that has been going through my brain all night long, the QBE formula, and to Dr. Furman's credit, she's talked about it, is outdated. The state is only giving us, what, one counselor for only 450 students, right? 499. Uh, 499 <laughs> students, and we've got one for every 250, and we're paying them more, and, we, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, we, we've got to tighten our belts, for sure. Yeah, and as I've shared, I'm sorry, Jenny. No, no, that's um, I was going to say, as I've shared in previous presentations with the board, I am having department conversations. We have kind of set the, the floor at the hiring freeze at Wilson Center. We are completing the audit to evaluate what positions should or could be hired or should or could be eliminated. Um, we are looking very line by line item at our department budget to make decisions on what can be paused, what can be eliminated. Um, you know, we are starting at central office um, before we look at making any changes in our schools. Our, you know, making sure we have maintained excellent learning environment in our classroom. And I guess I'm, I'm comfortable making a decision about this type of increase for our um, essential workers, our nutrition staff, our transportation staff, and our teachers. Um, who are, you know, so deserving of this increase. And so for this particular increase, I'm I'm more comfortable and then working from there to see what we need to do. Um, because, you know, they don't get a paid enough, you know, already. And then to um have to persevere through um the past two years. Um, and particularly our transportation and nutrition workers who risk exposure, exposure early on, um, I'm willing to do that now and then to see what suggestions that you come up with um, to make it, to balance everything. We're only having this conversation because of the governor's yes. right. I think it's, you know, we all agree that it's fundamentally the right thing to do to give the staff something above what they already take. I think the question, the real question, the real meat of the matter is, how do we adjust going forward? Mm -hmm. so in addition yeah. to taking some things, reorganizing some things, we may have to triage what new projects we take on, right. on mm -hmm. some things we have to roll over into the next week. I think, you know, we want to put it out there that we all agree that making sure that the, the, the staff, the instructional staff, um, are rewarded for all of their hard work is morally we just have to figure out how to move. So, so to that end, if we're looking at this here, where we're at a uh, 5.97 million fund balance, and we're you know, going to be potentially talking about the full amount for everyone, which I'm comfortable because I do agree with the conversation around uh, rewarding those who have stuck with us through this. Um, I am going to want an assurance that we're not talking about paying for that in the next budget by finding cuts on the instructional side. I'm going to want to see clear, clear cuts on central office and operations to offset that increased expense. We're also, I mean, just so that we're, we're clear about it, we're also talking about uh, a pretty significant increase in um, mental health resources, counselors in session in schools. Uh, I'm not entirely, and I'll have some comments about this in a minute. I'm not convinced that we're going far enough. I tend to agree with Maria 
And so that's an even additional expense that we're going to have to be able to figure out covering in this next budget. And so I just want some assurance that when we go through this process and we offer this reward to teachers and for essential workers, we're not setting ourselves up to then have to cut some of those individuals in the next budget in order to be able to maintain paying for the reward that we just gave them. I know that you can't offer that assurance. <laughs> I wish we, we could, yeah. I think it's it's a, a hard look at the budget, um, and that's what I've been sharing in our public input sessions at SCLP. What I've been sharing with the board is we do have a confluence of of several factors that we're at a critical point with the budget. Um, we do have to look at ways to increase revenue, but we also have to look at ways to decrease expenditures. Um, so that is just going to be the way that we have to move forward in discussions with the budget. And our number one priority is always maintaining the absolute best environment for our students in the classroom. Um, which is making sure we have the most highly qualified staff on hand. And that's our plan to move forward with that. And also just bringing your attention to prior to us receiving the information about the amended budget, we were at 1%. That was the projection for one. So I thought we looked bad, but better than that. That is worth pointing out, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're, right <laughs> for all practical purposes, we're talking about getting not 1.3 million really from the state, right? It's a little under 900,000 exactly. in net from the state, right? Because they're, they're they're handing it over and then taking it back. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, so we're in effect taking $800,000 and then pulling a little bit more out of reserve plus that in order to cover what we're talking about today. Can you talk about the slide that you pulled up for me a little bit? Well, so, um, positions. so I do anticipate on having savings from those positions. So here you see in the past that the projection, which is in purple, and the actual, which is in orange, that there's a big gap. So the actual has been overstated. But since I have been working here, you see that gap is closed. Mm -hmm. So I'm not overstating <laughs> any information. Given. Okay. So I was correct. You were. <laughs> <laughs> he wants you to say he was correct. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I remember that there was a conversation that the actual projected was a gap, right. and, and I had yeah. sent Renita an email about that, and then one of her 20 um, for that. And I really appreciate mm -hmm. that because that is a hard thing to do. Um, but I mean. You're working with like five different things, so I appreciate that. So it sounds like the board is in agreement with tentatively moving forward on option three for the FY22 amended budget. Can I have a motion for the tentative approval of option three for the fiscal year 2022 budget? I, I move. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, all in approval of the tentative approval of option three for the fiscal year 2022 budget, please say aye. 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 The tentative approval of option three for the fiscal year 2022 budget is approved. The board was provided monthly data reports from each school as information only. Um, so that's the next agenda item, but that's information only. Um, we have future dates listed on the agenda for upcoming meetings, trainings, and retreat. Um, board members, are there any questions about future dates for the um, work of the board? Okay, I, and I want to make sure that um, everyone, just a reminder that on February 15th, next Tuesday, we will have two more presenters um, to come to the district uh, to present on how two other um, organizations that will present on how they conduct the superintendent search. And so um, that meeting will start at 5.30 next um, Tuesday. 5.30, yes. Yep. Oh, right, yes. All right, any, any questions on future dates? All right. Well, if there are no other questions, um, thank everyone. For, yes. I do have other questions. Okay. I, I have a couple things that I wanted to raise, if that's, uh, if that's okay. Okay. 
specifically related to some of the conversation that we had today on, on mental health. I just wanted to ask uh, for a couple um, clarifying points. I know, Dr. Furman, you talked about that we are putting a plan together. I just want to ask about the timing and when we would expect to see that. And um, if that's not something that we can answer right now, it is something that I would like to have answered. Right. Just to make of sure course. Um, and then since these are not items on the agenda, I think perhaps the better way to handle these um, would be for you to send me an email with those questions and we can provide a response. Okay. In the future, what is the right way to ensure that these are items that I have an opportunity to discuss? Because we also did discuss this. Yeah, so that's where um, you send your agenda item to Ms. Johnson Davis for her to consider and um, get a motion from another board member to put them on the agenda. Okay, all right. And, and we have the calendar yep. that gives us the dates that we should have Correct. those agenda items. I don't um, know that we have that for the current calendar, but I will get it to the board. That was for, where, was that for next year? That was for next year, but it's, oh. it's the same date range for this year. I just okay. didn't have it kind of all calendared out for you guys. Okay. I will say that it was on the board that uh, on there that we should uh, talk about our representatives and we're reaching out to them. Um, and while that is a subject, Hans, one of the big issues for me is someone who's lost a family member to suicide in the past. And uh, that the state's funding of one counselor for every 400 is, um, what did you say, 499? Is offensive. And um, does the cater do everything we can? No. Can we constantly do better? Yes. Uh, but that's something that you should also reach out to your representatives about. Um, mm -hmm. Because if they would increase that number, we could do even more as a school district. Right. Um, and I pulled up a map the other day and like, um, like Bullitt County, like one for 490 students um, and something like that. So to your, to, to your thing. So. Um, it is only a subject that we should reach out to our representatives. Mm -hmm. and I encourage the students at Decatur and, and Maria and her very powerful voice to mm -hmm. do that as well. And well, I would, I would like to just formally ask the board to have that as an agenda item in the next. I mean, I, we understand that we had the conversation today about mental health. It felt to me like it would be as a board. But since we aren't apparently going to now, I would like to make sure that we have the opportunity to do that at a future meeting. Um, in either um, work session or um, public meeting, because it, it feels like it would be a work session mm -hmm. um, topic that yeah. we can really go into, yeah. de uh -huh, into depth with. Um, if it's a work session topic, I would like to request community representatives, like, for example, Ms. Rothman, to attend or to speak with us as we go through that work. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we will talk more about that offline. Great. All right. All right. Thank you all for um, joining for joining us. This meeting is now adjourned at eight twenty eight. Thank you.